Hello everyone. I'm so glad you decided to join me for story time during Resilience Week. Before we get started, let's talk a little bit about Resilience Week and what that means. Resilience can be described as the ability to bounce back after really hard or difficult times. It means that when we deal with really hard things that sometimes happen in life, we have the ability to overcome them. It sounds kind of like a superpower, and the really great news is that we all carry that superpower. Now, this doesn't mean that we don't sometimes feel sad, hurt, or upset. It means that when we're feeling down or when we come upon hard times, we have the ability to overcome and even grow. For instance, you may feel really sad if you were to fail a test or a quiz at school, but you have the ability to bounce back by practicing or studying for the next test or quiz instead of just giving up and not trying again. Who knows, your next quiz or test could be your best grade yet. And even if that's not the case, you have practiced these those skills and you're stronger because of it. Right now, you may be feeling really sad about your school closing early this year, but instead of letting it get you really down, think about all of the learning that you can still do. Maybe this is a time that you can help share, share the knowledge that you have with someone younger than you, or maybe you could take some time to learn something more about what something more about what you really love. I think most of us would say that losing someone really important to us would be a hard thing to go through. And at times like this, it's really important that we have coping skills to help us deal with all of our big feelings. Coping skills are things we can do or use to help us handle or deal with our big emotions. Coping skills can also help us deal with stressful times. For instance, when you are feeling really big feelings, have you ever taken a few big deep breaths? Or maybe you went for a walk. Maybe you journal. Maybe you listen to music. Maybe you talked to a trusted friend or adult, sat in a quiet place. Maybe you had a pet just like mine that you pet and kind of sat with. Or maybe even you drew or created art. All of these are great coping skills. What's important is that we each find coping skills that work for us so we can add them to our coping skills toolbox. Much like a builder would have lots of different tools to get their jobs done, we need lots of different coping skills to help us when we're experiencing big feelings or emotions or when we run into hard times. These coping skills will help us build our resilience or our, or our ability to overcome hard things. Stay tuned to the end of this video where I share some additional coping skills you can add to your coping skills toolbox. In the book I'm about to share with you, you'll learn about the main character, Bird. Bird goes through some really tough times and even experiences some really big feelings. You know, you'll see that he ends up using coping skills to help him overcome these really hard times and really big feelings. I challenge you to pay close attention to the end of the story so that maybe you can name a few of the coping skill Bird uses. But remember, everyone uses different coping skills and it's important to find the ones that work for you. So let's begin our story. The story I'll be sharing is called Bird. It's written by Zeta Elliott and it's illustrated by Shonda Strickland. And also, it's important to note that I am reading this book with permission from Lowe and Lee Books. So let's begin. Bird by Zeta Elliott, illustrated by Shonda Strickland, and published by Lowe and Lee Books. Today, I saw a bird outside of my window. It was perched on the rusty rail of the fire escape, shivering in the winter wind. I wanted to open my window and bring the bird inside where it was warm, but a sudden gust of wind blew the bird away. I drew a picture so I wouldn't forget. Mama and Papa named me Mackay, but Granddad calls me Bird. That's what he used to call me anyway. Granddad passed about a year ago. Now that he's gone, his best friend, Sonny, looks out for me. I call him Uncle Son. He comes by once a week and takes me to the park. Mostly Uncle Son and I just sit on our usual bench tossing stale bread to the pigeons. Uncle Son says he likes talking to me because I keep him on his toes. I like talking to Uncle Son because he treats me like I'm grown, not like I'm some little kid who can't understand anything. Uncle Son tells me stories about Granddad and all the daring missions they went on during the war. 
Granddad and Uncle Sun were pilots. They used to fly even higher than the birds. Uncle Sun says flying a plane is the best feeling on Earth, except you're not on Earth, really. You're part of the sky. Sometimes, on my way home from school, I stop to visit Uncle Sun. He lets me sit at his kitchen table while I do my homework. Uncle Sun puts his favorite jazz records and makes coffee for us in an old saucepan. When I'm finished with my homework, we sit on Uncle Sun's lumpy sofa and sip our sweet black coffee. Once I told Uncle Sun I wished I could play the saxophone like Charlie Parker. Uncle Sun just shrugged. That other bird, he's all right. But don't you waste your time trying to be like him. You just remember, everybody got their something, and that includes you. I like to draw. I'm not real good at it yet, but I try to practice every day. Uncle Sun says that's how you get good at a thing. Do it over and over until you can practically do it with your eyes closed. For now, I keep my eyes open because I'm still learning how to get it right. It's kind of hard. Sometimes the picture I draw on the page doesn't look like the real thing. Other times, the picture I draw looks even better than what I'm copying. That's what I like about drawing. You can fix stuff that's messed up just by using your imagination or rubbing your eraser over the page. I draw the things I see in my neighborhood, buses and trees and buildings and people, but mostly I like to draw birds. That's not why they call me bird though. Granddad gave me that name after I was born. He said I used to lay in my crib with my mouth wide open. I cheep just like a baby bird in its nest waiting to be fed. When I was little, I need someone to look out for me. My big brother Marcus used to do that, but he can't anymore. Some days when my folks are working late, I go up on the roof. I'm not supposed to do that, but I only stay for a little while and I never go near the edge. I just sit and watch the birds fly. Most people think birds fly by flapping their wings, but that's just partly true. They flap their wings for takeoff and landing, but once they're up in the sky, they just spread their wings and soar. Marcus used to go up on the roof, but not to watch the birds. His face would be all tight and angry when he left, but when he came back downstairs, Marcus would be chill. He never let me go up on the roof with him, but sometimes afterward, he'd take me to the store and buy a big bag of chips and two bottles of soda. Then we'd go to the park and hang out. I never asked him why his eyes were so red. I just listened to my big brother talk about the sky. Marcus told me there was a place high above the clouds where everything was calm and chill. Sure can't find no peace in the street, Marcus would say. I guess that's why he went up on the roof. Marcus was real good at art. He was the one who taught me how to draw. He'd make fancy words with all kinds of colors and swirls. Marcus would show me the picture when it was done. A few days later, I'd see it up on a wall near my school. Granddad called it garbage graffiti, but Marcus called it art. Granddad said real art belonged in a museum. Marcus said our hood was his museum. He said the street was where he belonged. Marcus stopped drawing a few years ago. That was around the time he stopped going to school, and that made our folks real upset. Sometimes Marcus would walk me to school. Then he'd go hang out in the park. I'd ask him if I could hang out with him and his friends, but Marcus said no. It's not too late for you, Marcus would tell me. Stay in school and make Mama proud. If I complained or talked back, Marcus would get tough with me. Do what I say and not what I do. He would snarl like a fierce pit bull. Marcus could be scary sometimes. But then he'd smile a little so I'd know we were cool. I'd go to school and Marcus would leave. Whenever I finished one of my drawings, I'd show it to Marcus. He would tell me whether I was getting better or not and he'd show me ways to fix my mistakes. One time I knocked on his bedroom door, but Marcus didn't say come in. The door was a little bit open, so I pushed it just enough to let my head inside. Marcus was curled up on his bed, shaking and sweating. I asked him what was wrong. Marcus mumbled something about needing a fix. Don't tell mama, he whispered. I didn't know how to fix Marcus, so I left my drawing on the floor and went back to my room. The only people I ever saw shaking and sweating like that were the crazy people in the park. Mama called them addicts. 
Grandad called them junkies. Papa said to stay away from them, because people like that would do just about anything to get more drugs. I stared at the eraser on the end of my pencil. Then I drew a picture of me and Marcus up on the roof. Marcus was better the next day, but after that night, he started to come home less and less. One Sunday, when we got home from church, all our stuff was gone. Our TV, our stereo, the microwave, my video games, and all of Mama's jewelry. I thought we'd been robbed, but Papa didn't call the police. Mama sat down at the kitchen table and put her hand over her face. Granddad called a locksmith. Later that night, Papa told me that if Marcus came by, I wasn't allowed to let him in. That didn't make sense to me, because Marcus is family and he lives here too. But Papa said that Marcus was sick, and until he got better, Marcus couldn't come around anymore. I asked Papa if what Marcus had was catching. Papa looked at me for a moment. Then he shook his head and held me long and tight. I try really hard to obey my parents, but sometimes I break the rules. A few weeks after we changed the locks, I heard a knock at the door. Mama and Papa were still at work, and Grandad was listening to his radio. I didn't take the chain off, but I opened the door and peeked outside. Marcus was standing there in the hallway. He didn't look so good. I figured he was still sick, but Marcus said he was feeling a lot better. He told me that he'd be coming home soon. I wanted to take the chain off the door and let my brother inside, but Marcus said he couldn't stay. He just came by to give me something. He pulled a bag out of his jacket and handed it to me. Inside was a book about birds. I asked Marcus to wait a minute, then I ran to my room and took my best drawing off the wall. I raced back to the door and slipped it to Marcus. This is the best one yet, he said with a smile. Marcus carefully folded my drawing and put it inside his jacket. Then he went away. I asked Grandad what it would take to fix Marcus. Grandad pressed his lips together and thought for a long time. Then he put his arm around my shoulder and said, Some breaking things can't be fixed, bird. Later I went to my room and drew a picture of Marcus, the way he used to be, before he got sick. Back when he was my big brother and not some junkie we had to lock out of her home. I pinned my drawing to the wall and stared at it until my eyes filled up with hot, angry tears. Marcus's face became a blur. I threw my pencil at the wall and it snapped in half. The next day I taped my pencil back together but Marcus never got better. After the funeral, Grandad went to bed and stayed there for a real long time. Mama said his heart was troubling him, but Grandad said his bones were just tired. That was about the time Uncle Son started to look out for me. Now we go to the park together every week. Thanks to the book Marcus gave me, I can name pretty much any bird I see. Uncle Son likes the mallard duck best because it's got a shiny green head like a soldier wearing a helmet. I like the cardinal because it's bright red with a pointy crest. When it flies, the cardinal looks like a fiery spark blowing through the trees. In the wintertime, it's easy to see the blue jays playing tag in the branches. Uncle Sun knows a lot about flying. He told me that birds aren't light because of their feathers, but because they got hollow bones. Uncle Sun said things that live in the sky are fragile. We only think that they're strong. I wish I could have fixed Marcus, I told Uncle Sun. He just turned his lips upside down and slowly shook his head. You can fix a broken wing with a splint, and a bird can fly again, he said, but you can't fix a broken soul. Then Uncle Sun told me a story his Nana told him when he was just a boy. There was a time, he said, when our people could fly. Back when there were still whips and chains, folks held on just as long as they could, but when the body broke, the spirit went free and carried the poor soul home to Africa. Is Marcus in heaven or Africa? I asked. Uncle Son said that Marcus was at peace. Granddad passed two months after Marcus. Uncle Son said he thought Granddad went to heaven to keep his eye on Marcus. That made sense to me. The next time Uncle Son and I went to the park, I looked up at the sky instead of the trees. The sun was going down. It looked like a pink and silver blanket was about to cover the whole world. Heaven's that space high above the clouds where everything is calm and still, right? I asked. Uncle Son nodded at me and smiled. When I got home, I drew a picture so I wouldn't forget. The end. Thank you for sharing that book with me. 
Did you recognize some of the coping skills that Bird was using throughout this story? Bird loved to draw. And he shared his work with his brother Marcus. It seems Marcus used art for coping as well. Look at Marcus's graffiti. Marcus considered graffiti art. You see, art may look different to each of us. When Bird was having really big feelings or going through a really hard time, he used drawing as a coping skill. What coping skills do you use? Here's a list of lots of other coping skills to try. Remember, Bird used art and drawing. However, there's lots of different ones that you can try. Aside from art or drawing, you could listen to music, you could practice yoga, you could cook or bake, read a book, play outside, maybe talk to someone, um, smile, laugh, play with slime, ride your bike, or maybe even throw a basketball. What's important is that you find a coping skill that's right for you. And once you find this coping skill, be sure to add it to your coping skills toolbox. Here's an idea of a coping skills toolbox you can use, or you can always draw your own. But don't forget, the important part is adding in all of the coping tools. Here are some examples of coping tools you could add to your toolbox. So like counting to 10, taking a deep breath, going for a walk, or you can make up ones on your own. Remember, it's about finding the coping tools and coping skills that work best for you. Thank you so much for sharing this book with me today. I hope you'll continue to celebrate Resiliency Week with us. Until next time, take care.